Our next speaker, our keynote speaker for the morning is Dr. Rosina Bierbaum, uh, Dean and Professor of uh, Natural Resources and Environmental Policy in the School of Natural Resources and Environment at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, Dr. Bierbaum is the uh, 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 Dean of the, uh, the only school at any major university that successfully brings uh, into one shared professional educational enterprise the natural sciences, social sciences, and planning and design. Uh, Dr. Bierbaum will be discussing the impact of climate change on cities in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Basin. Uh, her experience uh, prior to the University of Michigan includes 20 years of science policy leadership in Washington, D.C., uh, and as the acting director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, not under the current administration. She was the, uh, I, quick, to, quick to note, uh, she was the administration's senior scientific advisor in environmental research and development. She currently serves on the boards of the University uh, Corporation for Atmospheric Research, National Research Council's Board of Atmospheric uh, Sciences and Climate, uh, the Federation of American Science, Scientists, many, many, many others. Uh, let me not read the list, but, uh, but tell you that I've had the, um, the, 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 the pleasure of getting to know uh, uh, Dr. Bierbaum, um, principally through two presentations that I heard her make uh, at the uh, Sundance Conference of Mayors uh, on Climate Control, uh, Climate uh, Protection. Um, it, where, uh, where she w was so able to take the, uh, the, the difficult to understand uh, scientific principles uh, and present them to people uh, like me who have uh, no background in, in science in a way that was accessible and, and understanding. I know you're going to enjoy her presentation this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Rosina Bierbaum. Well, good morning, everyone. That's a hard uh, act to follow and a hard thing to keep up with, but I want to thank Mayor Hartwell for both the invitation and those very kind remarks. I also want to congratulate all of you on this resolution on the global threat of climate change, um, and especially for the sharing of best practices and the urging of action at all levels, from the local to the international. I believe there really is no more time to delay, and we need to get on with acting to control climate change. I also believe that a picture can be worth a thousand words, and so I'm going to try to take you through an encyclopedia in the next 30 minutes. Um, I want to start by saying that I think we, be, we must all think about climate change in a fundamentally different way. It is, of course, a matter of degrees, but I mean degrees in three ways. It is a matter of the temperature increase as depicted by the leftmost panel. But climate change will also play out in the terms of the degrees of environmental insults or the amalgam of the impact on our environment of climate change in concert with the whole suite of other stressors, air pollution, habitat fragmentation, invasive species. And we need to understand these in order to be able to cope. And third, depicted by the globe on the right, climate change is a matter of degrees, and in this sense I mean in terms of latitude and longitude, because where you live on the planet determines how it will feel to you and what resources you will have in terms of scientific and technological know-how and money to cope with the changes that are underway. That determines how vulnerable you are and what your adaptive capacity can be. And I would argue that the society has spent far too much time thinking about where the temperature is going to equilibrate and not nearly enough on the second and third panel, the so what parts of the question, how will climate change play out and what does it mean to me and what can I do about it? So I'm going to talk about each of these panels very quickly in succession. The first one is, of course, temperature. And I hope you all know that the temperature of the planet, on average, has increased about a degree C, uh, which is about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit already. And we're headed to perhaps another 3 to 10 degrees over this century. Despite some of the old popular press, you cannot explain that rate of temperature increase in the last 100 years by any natural things, not by El Ninos or sunspots um, or changes in um, uh, ENSOs, the El Ninos. You simply cannot, ex you cannot explain that rate of increase unless 
you can attribute it to, to greenhouse gases. And scientists think we have nailed the attribution question. The change in temperature in the last 100 years is mainly due to human influence. And the smoking gun in this case is the buildup of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere, the most important of which is carbon dioxide. And this is the tracing of carbon dioxide from the pre-industrial level on the lower left you see from 1880 until you see my yellow line screaming off the graph there. I need to create a new chart. But concentrations of CO2 have gone from about 285 parts per million up 35 percent to about 385 and headed to perhaps 1,000 parts per million under business as usual. Now keep that curve in mind and let me show you a curve for the same time of energy use on this planet. And you see that the top three gray and black colored bars are gas, oil, and coal. Those are the carbon-based fuels. You burn a carbon-based fuel, you produce carbon dioxide. And you can see that they have risen very prodigiously since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and that's where the CO2 is going into the atmosphere principally from, although deforestation con contributes about another 20%. But I also want you to notice the little blue bands on the bottom. So for all the talk about nuclear and hydro and biofuels, that's about 15% of the world's energy supply at this moment. We are 85% carbon-based or fossil fuel, and therein lies the problem because there's a lot more growth to happen yet. You know a developing country person on average uses about a tenth of the energy that we do and they aspire to our, our quality of life. So what might the future portend? Well suddenly that graph is dwarfed by a potential range of futures. The red lines showing low, medium, and high future energy scenarios. Perhaps we haven't seen anything yet. If those scenarios are fueled by fossil fuels, the carbon in the atmosphere will take us to levels that are perhaps four times pre-industrial levels. And remember, we're about 35% above pre-industrial levels today. So I really think that two futures face us depicted by these two globes. The lower globe is where we're headed under business as usual, with temperatures equilibrating over our part of the world at 15 to 25 degrees above the levels that they were in 1880. I would argue that this is a roasted globe. The upper globe is what temperatures would be if we were successful in stopping concentrations as they go through a doubling of those pre-industrial levels. That comes out to about a three degrees C temperature increase over the planet, which ecologists recently have said is actually too much, that that gets us into dangerous territory in terms of how species can adapt. But remember now, the bottom is where we're headed. The top is going to be tough, and I'll show you at the end what it would take to get there. But in fact, that may be too much temperature. Let's look at the middle panel, which I said is the amalgam or the degrees of environmental insults. We know that climate change isn't happening in a vacuum. And if you think about it, of course, climate change is related to air quality because hotter temperatures enhance smog formation. Um, warmer temperatures and carbon dioxide affect how plants grow and affect the growing season. So we may have a warmer and a wetter, and could it be a greener world? Well, perhaps, but it actually depends what kind of plants are going to win. And the devil appears to be in the details. Some early studies are showing that, unfortunately, some of the noxious weeds preferentially do better as climate changes. And so you see there garlic mustard on the left, purple loosestrife in the middle, and one that's headed our way, kudzu, which has historically been limited by the frost line and the moisture line, both of which are moving as climate change is moving. Similarly, of course, to think about the invasive species in the Great Lakes, warmer waters could aid and abet the reproduction of certain sport fish, harm others. It also could aid and abet the reproduction or the competitive advantage of some of our Great Lakes invasives. And we really don't understand this, and we certainly need to. I would argue we've got to be increasingly careful that we don't try to solve one problem without thinking of the lens of climate change because the answers might be different when you think about the composite effect. And we may actually implement solutions that turn out to be inefficient or ineffective. The third area is uh, latitude and longitude, or where on the globe you live, and that certainly determines how you feel. In our area of the world, 
here's what we're projecting by 2100, that the temperatures will increase. And I guess the quick vision there, look at how Michigan moves in orange to the lower left where our summers, the oranges of summers, by the end of the century are going to feel more like Arkansas and the upper peninsula more like Missouri. And I think that kind of dropping of about a third of a tier of states gives you kind of a quick impression of what it'll feel like as we become a more tropical state. Different kinds of things live in Missouri and Arkansas than live here today. And for certain parts of the planet, it actually is going to completely change their way of life. Um, you can see here an Arctic native trying to hunt in a greatly diminished ice area. Or if you look at India and the increasing droughts, because as you warm up the planet, you actually speed up the whole water cycle. You increase evaporation and you increase precipitation. So paradoxically, there will be more droughts and there will be more floods. And actually, there are very good data that by decade since 1950, every part of the globe has experienced both more droughts and more floods on a continental level. But this picture makes it very clear how much human suffering and pain can be caused in developing countries as climate changes, and especially countries that are so very dependent on natural resources for their livelihood. So I want to argue that all of us need to think more about climate change, not just as where the temperature is going to go, but the interaction with the other environmental stresses and also the degree of um, latitude and longitude or how different regions and places will respond to climate change. So in, in my view, climate change actually is going to affect every part of our life. On the left, you see temperature, which is going to increase precipitation, which is, um, and temperature will also increase sea level because you have melting of glaciers and you have expansion of the ocean waters. And those three things will change the ideal range for where everything will live, where we can have agricultural crops, the supply of water, our coastal areas, our ecosystem composition, our energy supply and demand, and our communities and our health systems. I, I hope that there isn't anyone here that really still doubts that climate change is real. But I did want, just for a quick snapshot of the science, to show you the four successive statements in each of a five-year period by the consensus documents produced by 2,000 scientists from 150 countries. And if you look at the first one back in 1990, they're saying temperatures are increasing, but we don't really know what's going on. The second one, by 1995, in what actually the scientists thought was a brilliant declarative sentence, they said, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on the global climate. They're saying we see a human fingerprint. By 2001, and this is a startling statement for a group of scientists to make, relatively uncaveated, new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is due to human activities. And just this year, much more powerful statements saying they're applying more than a 90% probability that is human caused, it's virtually certain. And not only that, we are now seeing ocean warming, continental changes, not just global averages, and we can characterize changes in extreme events, droughts and floods, and link them to climate change for the first time. Here is the temperature record of the planet, and you can see the last 50 years, how it has kind of unequivocally risen, and the signal has emerged from the noise of natural variability. On the continental scale, you can see the dark lines in each continent is the temperature record over the last 120 years, and being in the pink band, which is what the models predict it would happen, shows that we are characterizing pretty well what the temperature should be doing. If, if there were no climate change, the temperature should be in the blue bands. And you see they are all in the pink bands. And in the case of some of the continents, the temperature increases are actually at the upper end of what the models predict. And we're beginning to see changes. This map shows you pictures of all the places on the Earth where there have been global warming studies that have attributed changes to a climate change. And so all of the orange icons are sort of physical indicators. They represent heat waves and ice melt and sea level rise. And all the purple indicators are biological changes and human impacts, um, plant and animal range shifts. We've studied now 1,400 species of plants and animals. And on average, 
they're moving six kilometers a decade north as the climate map is moving with them. And if you think about our ecosystems, can all the parts move together, the parts that fly and swim and crawl as the temperature changes are moving at this rate, which is four to ten times anything we've seen in the historic record. It's a very, very fast rate. I'm sure you all heard that Greenland is melting twice as fast as it was five years ago. None of our climate models can account for that. That's a surprise in certainly the wrong direction. And if that continues, we're not looking at something like a 20-inch sea level rise over this century. We could be looking at meters. So again, a lot of devil in these details that we don't completely understand. Let's see what this would pose for the Great Lakes region. We already are seeing temperatures rising. Um, we already are seeing an increase in extreme rainfall events, whether you look at a 24-hour period or a week period. Our winters are becoming about a week shorter. Spring is coming about a week earlier. And ice cover on all the small lakes and the Great Lakes has been decreasing. And so that leads to increased evaporation all winter long. And so paradoxically, that leads to the Great Lakes levels dropping. Here's a depiction of what's happened in terms of the intense events. So I just blew up for you uh, the dots that are over our region. The biggest dot show a 100% increase in extreme rainfall events. So that's a doubling. Well, those are not the gentle rains from heaven that are going to help grow our crops, as Shakespeare talked about. These are the erosive rains that can lead to flooding. And what do we project in the future for our Great Lakes region? Well, the temperatures will go up another 5 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, um, up to 11 degrees Celsius over the next 100 years, depending on whether it's summer or winter, but it's definitely up. The growing season should be several weeks longer. And that may be good news, but look at what the third bullet says, more extreme events. So while we may have warmer growing seasons and longer growing seasons, we also expect to be getting more storms and floods and droughts. And if you look at agriculture, I'll now like to take you through kind of a sectoral approach. If you, if you think about agriculture, the things that we would need to worry about would be changes in um, the food supply. Is it going to be threatened? Changes in crop yields. Can we still grow the same plants? And what's going to happen with water and irrigation demands? And I know you had a number of discussions about this yesterday. So here, as I say, I do think that we'll have some longer growing seasons, but the constraints will be what's happening with soil moisture with increased evaporation. We're going to be producing ozone at hotter temperatures. That affects crops. Warmer, wetter weather could lead to more pests, uh, storms and floods during planting and harvesting. And I would remind you that, you know, if you think about the history of U.S. agriculture, this shows you crop, corn crop productivity over 50 years. And it has been increasing steadily. But look at where there are huge losses. It is because of droughts and blights and storms. So I would argue we don't do a very good job today dealing with extreme events. And yet we know those are going to increase in the future. And I would argue that one of our important planning and management options should be to figure out how to cope not just with the slowly changing averages, but also with the extreme events. In terms of water, which we're surrounded by, we need to worry about the supply of it. Is it reliable? The quality of it? And is there going to be competition for water in the coming years? Let me just show you the lake cover on four of the five Great Lakes. You probably can't read any of this, but all I want you to do is look at the maze line. And for the four lakes, <clears throat> which are Lake Huron, upper left, Lake Ontario, upper right, Lake Erie, bottom left, Lake Michigan, bottom right, ice cover gone down over since 1972. And if I had Superior, but I couldn't cram it on this chart, that was going down too. So the lake levels are dropping now. They're expected to drop under climate change. And this messy chart, let me tell you what it shows. The gray band is the area of lake levels in Ontario, Lake Ontario, that we now can manage for. All of the squiggly lines are model runs of what the lake levels will be in the future. And you can see there are a whole lot of model runs that are way lower than what we manage for today, below that gray band. And there are actually some that are above. And so preparing to manage lake levels for perhaps increasing variability in levels, I would argue, is going to be very important for us in the coming future. 
We know, for example, what incredible lows and incredible highs can mean in terms of lake level. They affect transportation or navigation channels, um, tourism, the aesthetics of our beaches. They affect hydropower, water quality in cities. And so we need to understand whether we can cope with these potential changes in water levels. Now, I was trained as an ecologist, and so, of course, one of my great concerns is what's going to happen to natural ecosystems. We expect shifting zones of forests and natural areas. This is going to threaten the places we've drawn boundaries around, the parks that we have said we want to protect because we like them the way they are as this climate map kind of moves their species out from under us, and will certainly affect uh, tourism. So this shows you a map on the left with lots of colors, the current forests in the U.S., and the map on the right, the predicted forest cover in 2100. Again, you can't read it, but impressionistically you can say, that's a simpler map on the right. There are fewer species there. There are still forests. And what's happened? The red has gone north into Canada, and those are our wonderful maple forests, which are going to be completely outside the U.S. by the end of the century. Also in the southeast, the loss of the loblolly pine, which is the blue smear on the left, uh, will certainly affect our uh, income in the U.S. from forestry. So Canada, I think you get our maple syrup and you get our fall foliage, but, and this is a Canadian analysis that was done actually back in time for the Kyoto Protocol, where we and Canada were arguing, hey, we can store lots of carbon in our forests because they're going to grow better as climate changes. But also the panel on the left shows historic forest fires, and on the right, the increase in forest fire expected as climate change carbon dioxide doubles because of the excess heat, the excess evaporation, and the increase in fire. So can we manage this kind of increase in forest fires? Another important question for communities. This is a very interesting chart that the Department of Agriculture put out where they simply declared the growing uh, planting zones in 1990 are no longer the planting zones today. And in 16 years, there has been a great shift in what can grow in which regions. So for example, Michigan on the left is zones four and five. You know what? We're now five and six. Nebraska's growing dogwoods. New York has imported now a hemlock fungus, which it was never warm enough to support before. Georgia is growing firebush. It raises a whole issue. So what's native anymore? All of us who are trying to plant native species, it's pretty clear this is a hard, hard thing to figure out. And one graphic that I think is uh, also particularly telling, the upper level map shows you the distribution of the Baltimore Oriole today. And again, Canada, it's going to be the Toronto Oriole because the chart on the bottom shows you the distribution of Orioles by the end of this century. So species are on the move. In some cases, at the top of mountains or at the top of the earth, there's no place for species to move. And as they've called the polar bear a charismatic megafauna, an example of um, a, a creature that is unlikely to be able to persist as the snow melts, something that could quite easily be gone by 2030. There's actually a new report from the consensus science body, the international community in April, that said 20 to 30 percent of the species on this planet will be imperiled as climate changes. 20 to 30 percent. As an ecologist, this is a horrible thing to think about. I mean, can we do away with one out of every four species? I don't feel very comfortable about that. It's almost inconceivable. And this is a cartoon that rose when that, that came up when that report came out. And it's Tommy Tolles, who's often in the Washington Post. You see a man reading a global warming uh, causing extinctions. And he's going, well, how many species do I need? And the two species in the picture, um, our burger on the left and McNugget on the right, and I don't know if you can read the tiny print, but it says uh, McNugget has the flu, <laughs> and so bird flu. But uh, example of how when an issue really arrives, it makes it into cartoons, and here was one that hit with the species extinction. But let's move to human health because, of course, that's very important to all of us. We worry about how climate change will affect weather-related mortality, whether it be the increase in floods or mudslides or droughts and starvation or heat stress. We worry about whether as climate changes, different vectors can live in different places. And we have to worry about air quality diseases because the heat will exacerbate a smog formation. And again, here's what we expect for this region. Of course, cold-related health problems will decline. Heat-related morbidity and mortality will increase. 
Extreme heat more likely, this was the week to talk about it. We are talking about between 20 and 40 days of um, more than 90 degree weather by the end of the century, half of those more than 97 degrees. I don't know about you, but that is not a particular future that I'm very comfortable with. Um, you can see the temperature increases in the two charts on the right, which are showing you on the top how many degree days over 90, and on the bottom how many degree days over 97. Uh, smog will be enhanced. This is a picture of expected increase in ozone by the end of the next century for our region. The orange areas are up to 10 parts per billion increase. That means about a 20 percent increase over what we have today in ozone levels. The ozone standard is 80. We run about 50 to 60. This would push us up to 60 to 70, right about at the health limit. We know a lot about Heat Island, and this chart shows you um, that when temperatures in the cities, at the highest point in the middle there, over 90 degrees, suburbia can be four to five degrees cooler. But cities and the increased heat stress in cities became a big issue in the U.S. in the Chicago heat wave of a few years ago, certainly in the European heat wave that killed 35,000 people a couple years ago, a rich part of the world in Europe. So heat stress kills, especially the elderly and the very young and those with cardiac problems. This is a chart that shows you how some of the cities uh, by the year 2020, which is the dark blue bar, and then by 2050 in the light blue bar, might experience increased mortality. Note that there are about 750 deaths per year in, 2100, in 2050 in Chicago. That's about the number that died in that extreme heat event a few years ago, but we're talking about this being every year. And you can see that it's much higher in New York City. And here's the chart for Toronto and Montreal, more on the order of 100 or 250 per year, not insignificant. But climate change does a lot of other things too. It's not just heat and ozone. Um, studies are showing that carbon dioxide has already increased ragweed pollen 30 percent, and the Part of poison ivy that uh, causes the rash is also enhanced by increasing temperature and precipitation. Molds and tree pollen are increasing. And we are seeing an increase in the range of the Lyme tick as well as perhaps the West Nile virus. The strain of West Nile virus that emerged in North America is very definitely linked to warmer temperatures. And the very warm temperatures observed in that 2002-2004 time frame led to huge numbers of um, the West Nile virus. And if that were to get going, the United States and Canada might be sharing a lot of that as well, because these are the north-south flyways, the Pacific flyway in green, the central flyway in orange, the Mississippi flyway with its two forks in yellow, and the Atlantic flyway in the almost red. So these, if, if it is carried and if migration serves to be a vector um, those are the pathways. What about Lyme disease? Um, my brother was just diagnosed in Pennsylvania with Lyme disease two weeks ago. Lyme disease spread depends on a few things. Ecological conditions, you need to have the vectors available uh, and the spirochete has to be uh, in them. You need to have particular social conditions, that is, can the critters leap across some of the boundaries that we've put in their way, uh, like cities, like roads, and then finally, climate conditions. Can the tick and the spirochete survive? Well, here's a modeling run between now and 2080, where yellow shows how habitat will become suitable, and red shows where we expect these ticks to expand. And so let me just go through and show you how, once again, it looks like we will be sharing uh, with Canada our ticks. And now to Mayor Becker, if nothing I've said so far has worried you, I did want to show one that might be more particularly appropriate for Wisconsin and resonate with you. Um, as you know, the Berkey was almost canceled in 2007 due to the lack of snow, and I think we should worry about if global warming leads to no snow, it will lead to no incentive to stay fit in winter, and it could also lead to more obesity. On a more serious note, let me come back to what communities need to think about. These climate change impacts are not occurring in a vacuum. We know the population is growing. We know urbanization and sprawl are continuing. We know we're fragmenting the landscapes, and we know we're polluting our lands and water. This leads to huge social challenges related to environmental justice and different responses required 
from where we live because of our variability in our limits. Um, in terms of our property or infrastructure, as I said, we expect more increased extreme events. This is going to put a heavier burden on our emergency systems. It's going to increase our costs of rebuilding. It's going to have a financial toll on our cities, our homeowners, and our businesses. Our water-related infrastructure is at risk, and we've talked about what might happen with lake levels. And so I would like to say, you know, we can plan ahead or we can react. The critters can only react, but humans can anticipate. And I would suggest that we get on with figuring out how our communities can anticipate and cope with these changes and develop planning and management options to deal with both the changing average temperatures and the changing extremes. I do not believe that the worst impacts are inevitable. I think there are things we can do. First, I think we need to minimize the pressure on the environment so that the composite degrees of environmental stress with climate change are not devastating. Second, we have to think about planning and management, things like how do we protect prairie potholes? How do we cope with heat stress in our cities? How do we deal with lower lake levels? How do we deal with increased floods and droughts? And finally, we have to slow the rate of emissions growth. As I said, the rate of changes in ecosystems are four to 10 times historic. If we can damp that rate of change, that gives us more time to adapt and it leads to a lower total temperature. And I want to spend the last five minutes that I probably don't have in talking about what it would take to stop at that non-roasted world. That first panel I showed you that would lead to about a three degrees Celsius global average temperature, 5.4 Fahrenheit. Well, this next chart, the orange line screaming through the top is that business as usual curve I showed you, the middle growth rate over the next century. If you don't want to go in that direction and end up where you're headed and you want to stop at that non-roasted world, your emission pathway has to be the green line. So we notice a couple things. The green line peaks at 10 billion tons of carbon. It peaks in about the year 2020. It is the world emission chart. So if the world can get off that orange line by 2020 and the whole world can be turning around and reducing emissions below levels they're at today, which is where that green line heads, then we can stop the temperatures and the concentrations um, from exceeding three degrees or twice pre-industrial. This is not an easy task. A lot of people have thought about it. Here is one example. If we can take a triangle out of that growth rate, we could slow um, the concentration growth and the, and the temperature growth. A number of people have worked on this, and one of the most popular is from a group at Princeton, Steve Pakala and Rob Sokolow, and they call it their wedge diagrams. In fact, there's wedge games that you can play online. And this next chart's gonna look messy, but I'll talk you through it. What they say is that triangle in the middle, which is what we have to take out of emissions growth, can be composed of seven items. And they give you 15 around the edges to choose from. So as long as you come up with seven, you can take that wedge out of emissions growth. And some of them, for example, are pretty onerous. So if you wanted to get one of the seven wedges from nucle nuclear, you would have to triple the nuclear power plants in the world today to be able to get one-seventh of what you need to do. I would argue that's a very difficult task if you look at the number of new nuclear plants uh, on the books, quite separate from even, you know, taking your political opinion on it. Ramping up to do that, it would be extraordinarily expensive. So this can be quite a depressing exercise, but I think there's also um, good parts to this too. Here, I've circled in pink, you can get four of the wedges from renewables from biomass, from wind, and from solar. And these are technologies that are not pie in the sky, but things that can be commercialized today. So you can get more than halfway there with renewables. And there are four wedges related to efficiency, light bulbs, appliances, cars, buildings, industry, or electricity production. So between efficiency and renewables, for example, you get eight wedges and you need seven. So it's not impossible, it's really hard but it is possible. And just to talk about the renewables for one second, if you look at Michigan, this is the size of the land area, the yellow, orange, and red square that would be needed to supply all of our electricity um, if it were produced by that single thing, by wind farms in the orange, by biomass from willow in the yellow, 
or by building integrated photovoltaics in red. I think it's unlikely we're going to find enough land for all that willow plantation, but this gives you a sense of is this big or small issue. I would also like to point out, though, that you know, while Chicago may be the windy city, we are sure a windy state. And this shows you the uh, wind power density uh, along various coasts of Michigan. We have a lot of great wind in Michigan. A recent study said that we actually would be the fourth best place to uh, locate manufacturing activity on wind. And just yesterday, there was a big story in the national press that said there's not enough manufacturing capacity to build the wind turbines that people want to build today. It seems like a very interesting time. We import a lot of energy into the state. If we actually used our own wind and built the turbines here, a new analysis by our Center for Sustainable Systems says we could produce several thousand jobs and several hundred million dollars annually of income for the states. I do want to end by saying, as we heard, that the cities are leading the way. Here are the cities in the U.S. that have signed the mayor protection, climate protection, and there are some, I think, 155 in Canada as well. The states are trying. There are 24 states that have renewable portfolio standards. I know we're considering it here now. There's a whole spate of bills in the Congress, and here, the shaded line dipping down to the right are the bills that would actually put the U.S. on the trajectory to stop at its share of the two-time CO2 world, the non-roasted world, the three-degree world. And so I guess I would say a couple of things to you is none of the bills really overshoot. <laughs> they, some of them are very uh, difficult, but that's the legislation in Congress now. Just yesterday, Bingham and Inspector, they're the, the V-shaped yellow line, changed their bill and introduced it, and that arrow going down would put it closer to the bills below it and get us on a path to potentially be on the green line. So I just want to say I am encouraged. A lot of industries are taking on their own targets and timetables without legislation. You can't pick up a paper anymore or a newspa newspaper or a magazine without having stories about climate change. Even today in the USA Today delivered to my room, there was an article on green hotels. Who would have thought that even a year ago? So I really think that we've reached sort of a tipping point in public opinion, public attention, science, um, and the costs and benefits. And even every religious group uh, in the world has put out a statement that climate change is a moral challenge. So I think we are going to rally, but there is really no time for delay. And I commend you all for taking the leadership position you all are to save this precious planet for those who will come after us for the next generation. So thank you very much for your attention and congratulations on all you're doing. Are there any questions? I think I probably used up the question time with two at this table. Uh, thank you for that phenomenal presentation. Uh, yesterday we heard from the St. Lawrence mayors uh, sounding the alarm about water levels in the St. Lawrence and how that may affect access from uh, the St. Lawrence into the Great Lakes. And I'm wondering if there's any research you're aware of that talks about water levels in the St. Lawrence and the potential impact on the Great Lakes as well. So I actually don't know that research. There may be somebody in the audience who would be a better person to answer that than I do. Um, I know that the Great Lakes Research Lab in Ann Arbor has started to look at that, and I know that there are obviously a number of efforts in Canada that are looking at that, but I have not seen any kind of sort of assessment produced yet. Has anybody in this room? I, mean, I think it's, it's very important that we're all looking at it now, um, but I have not yet seen that. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I think um, the Canadian National Adaptation Assessment and what used to be the old U.S. National Assessment, the impacts of climate change, you know, should be taking on in future years. You're still producing yours, Canada is still producing theirs, and they're really wonderful documents. The U.S. has kind of stepped away from 
that regional integrated look, and I'm very much hoping that we can back, get back to it. The Union of Concerned Scientists has tried to pick up a bit of that, but the regional assessment process in the U.S. is diminished. But I, I would hope that that actually would be part of the two-year adaptation study that Canada is doing now. They just released a report, I think, at the end of 2006, so the next cycle would be 2008. Does anybody actually uh, comment on that? No? One, oh, one more question. I'm being waved at here, so I guess you're it. I'll be <clears throat> uh, Corky Obermeyer with the City of Grand Rapids. Uh, <coughs> I had the pleasure of attending a conference at MSU a few months oh, ago, yeah. and, and uh, I was on a panel. You were there as well. And I think the aha moment from that for me was we're beginning to talk about adaptation now, not prevention. And uh, seeing your thinking about all the stuff that we do in the municipal sector with providing water and electricity and preventing floods or working to uh, for disaster preparedness and all that stuff, it's, it's really a bit uh, overwhelming almost to think about what's coming. Um, it's also curious because more flooding will generate more electricity needs and, uh, you know, all of that stuff. So uh, yesterday we, we enacted a water conservation program mm -hmm. here, which mm -hmm. is pretty awesome, I think, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we're m moving in that direction. But uh, could you speak a little bit about, I, I don't think you did in your presentation, about how it, if we're not careful, it could be a catch-22 because we're, we'll be having higher electrical needs for lowering temperatures for air conditioning and we'll have more water mm -hmm. needs for irrigating mm -hmm. the lawns and all of that stuff. Can you speak it, to that a little bit? Yeah, well, I think you're, the first thing, Corky, I would say yes. A the adaptation word, which I think was considered a bad word for many, many years, is now coming into the mainstream. That is the coping issue, and it's, it, historically it was if you talked adaptation, you weren't serious about mitigation. I think the pace of climate change is so clear that we need both, because it's changing now and we need to adapt. So yes on the adaptation. Um, this is what you're talking about with water and electricity. I think this is sort of like the, some of those devils in the details we don't think about if we only think sector by sector or problem by problem. And getting people together who deal with um, water supply and electricity production and city management is really important to, to even in a very crude sort of what if level figure out at what point kind of the system would break. How much flooding can you tolerate? How many days of increased heat can your electrical systems handle? And the intersection between water and energy. And that's something that again, because adaptation itself is being so newly studied, has not gotten very far. That was one of the sectors that in following on to the MSU conference, we at the University of Michigan tried to begin to take a look at the intersection of utility use, uh, energy. I mean, so even if you think, for example, most of the energy supply stuff comes through the Gulf, which of course is very sensitive to storms, tropical storms, which may be spun up as heat energy um, leads to more powerful hurricanes. And then look at the grid and the difficulty in handling um, heat stress in cities and keeping the power supply and the water to produce hydro, the water to cool power plants, and the water to barge coal. I mean, it, it really is, I think this is a very important intersection that I would en encourage our region to work on very hard. How can we cope with changing energy and water systems in this unique area where the Great Lakes are so precious to us? So I think there's a lot of uh, intersections and potential sort of breakpoints in the system that we have not yet thought about. And it, and it isn't really going to be rocket science if you have the planners and the managers of these different systems sit and talk about some of these what-if scenarios and if you can't cope, figure out if there is going to be a way around it, or do we have to diversify energy supply? Do we have to think about, you know, water rationing at particular points? But, but proactive, anticipatory adaptation and planning has got to be a lot better. You know, the weather-related disasters in, this, in, the, in the world have just reached, in 2005, $300 billion, not earthquakes. This is weather-related disasters. This is a third of a trillion dollars. The weather-related disasters are a big impact, and they're going to be increasing. So I'm, I'm right with you. This is a big area of study. We should do it regionally, and energy and water is right at the center. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Dr. Beer Mom. Um, I think it's a, a lot of the things that we've heard in bits and pieces, when it's all pulled together, it becomes such stark reality that um, <laughs> it uh, gives you a, a fair amount of pause uh, and reinforces the importance of the work that groups like this do.